Now to, to get to the main uh, event to introduce Dr. Dalla. Many of us around the GTU have known Dr. Dalla for a while before she was Dr. Dalla officially, because she came to the GTU in 2015 as an MA student and continued on as a presidential scholar, a PhD student. She's received numerous awards over the course of her, um, her study. In 2017, she received a Haas research grant for collaborative uh, Jewish Muslim studies in 2019, an Arthur Finding Davis Foundation grant for interreligious research, a Newhall Fellowship to co-teach the Women's Studies and Religion Seminar. And I know there are others that, that are going unlisted here because you know, we don't have all night to list them here. Uh, and just recently, 2021, she received her PhD. And so we were so, uh, we've been so fortunate to have known her as a student, as a staff member, as an instructor, and now as a professor and a program director. Um, and one thing about, I just to add another word about the Madrasa Midrasha program is that, you know, CIS, CIS, the Center for Islamic Studies, was founded in 2017. And the very next year, 2000, wait, I said that wrong, 20, 2007, excuse me, you near. Uh, the very next year, 2008, was the founding of the Madrasa Midrasha program. So it was sort of right away a good combination, a good collaboration. And the program has really thrived and grown and um, in this collaboration between the Centers for Jewish Studies and the Center for Islamic Studies. Um, it's an opportunity for study and dialogue and for a uh, greater understanding of Jewish and Islamic texts and tradition. Um, the Madrasa Midrasha program offers courses, research grants for GTU students, but also many, many workshops, lectures, and panel discussions and activities and events for the community. So I hope that you'll um, stay tuned and see what's happening in Madrasa Midrasha. And now that whole program is under the leadership of Dr. Dalla. So we're um, excited to see it sort of take wings even more than, than it has in the past. Um, so we're here, happy to have um, Majubin in that role. Dr. Dalla has for long, uh, many years, been a religious leader and a motivational speaker. She uh, focuses on community work, particularly with women and youth. She travels, she has traveled widely, widely, and I, I'm sure she will again someday when we're um, able to do so, uh, engaging uh, with Muslim women, working on matters related to social and economic justice and women's empowerment. And um, this feeds right into her talk tonight, which is entitled The Sermon of Fatima, Women's Theology, Leadership, and Social Justice. So uh, without further ado, Majabin. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, greetings with peace. Salam alaikum. Um, before I begin, I echo um, what Dr. Aronoff and Dr. Jiwa just said to thank Interim Dean Pena for and our office for taking the lead in organizing this event. Uh, of course, Dr. Dina Aronoff and Dr. Munir Jiwa for their exceptional work and support. These are some uh, great shoes that I'm going to be stepping into. Uh, for it, and I also want to thank Emily and Matt, Emily Morrow, Matt Hartman, and all those who helped to make this evening possible. And especially, of course, I want to thank you all for taking the time to attend. I know that Wednesday is a very busy day at the GTU, and I'm so uh, glad and grateful that you took the time to attend. Thank you. Uh, my paper this evening, as, uh, as Dean Pena suggested and, and stated, is titled The Sermon of Fatima, Women's Theology, Leadership, and Social Justice. And I'm going to be drawing upon my dissertation on the seventh century classical Islamic text known as the Sermon of Fatima to address contemporary discourses on Muslim women's theology, leadership, and social justice. But before I delve into the relevant excerpts from the sermon that I wanted to share with you today, Allow me to introduce the woman of my study and my positionality in relationship to the subject of my study. The Sermon of Fatima was delivered by Fatima. Fatima was the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and on his family. And as such, she is revered by all Muslims. But for the Shia, however, she is to them a core aspect of their identity and their theology. They consider her 
among the 14 immaculate ones, the first of whom is the Prophet Muhammad himself, and the last of whom is the Mahdi, the awaited savior of humanity according to Shia thought. Now in this list of 14 special individuals, she ranks second to the Prophet, and then equal to Imam Ali, who is the first Imam of the 12 Roshiyas, and then higher in rank than all the other 11 Imams in her lineage. So that itself says a lot about the woman's positionality among a group of 13 men. Now, after the Prophet's demise in 632 of the Common Era, Abu Bakr was selected as the Caliph. And soon after that, he confiscated Fatima's lands in Fedek. So the name is Fedek, and it was an agricultural land situated on the outskirts of Medina. Fatima argued for Fedek as her property and inheritance, for she was the sole surviving child of her father. She protested by delivering an epic sermon in the mosque of the prophet, addressing the masses and the caliph together. The sermon was delivered around 10 days after the demise of the prophet and marks a key moment in Islamic history with regards to understanding early Muslim debates around political leadership and then the subsequent sectarian divides among Muslims themselves. So this is the woman and, and this was the timeline of the sermon that she delivered. Now, as a community leader for the last two decades, I've addressed key themes around women's empowerment and social reform from the perspective of the Sermon of Fatima to local and global Muslim communities. My critique towards my own community has been around the portrayal of Fatima solely as a dutiful daughter, a supportive wife, and a devout mother, which is not a problem at all, but there has been little or no mention of her theological leadership and her social activism in speaking truth to power. Muslim women are called to serve the home and the community from the pulpits in most of the communities that I visited, but rarely given leadership positions, especially those that challenge the communal and cultural imagination of the role of pious women in a Muslim society. In these community sessions, I ask the question, if there were a Fatima among us today who would bravely walk into a male dominated space and theologically question the practices and policies of the community and its leadership, would we support her? Or is it that Fatima is to be revered as a saint, but not embodied as an activist? Despite her revered position in Islam and her foundational position in Shia theology, she is understudied in traditional mainstream Islamic history and in contemporary Islamic studies. That leads me to ask the question again, is this because she is a woman? The answer to this question is not difficult, given that traditional Islamic history much like the rest of world history, is, um, is majorly an account of men by men with peripheral to no documentation of women's voices of concern or contribution. Or is it, I ask, because of the highly provocative content of the sermon, which could easily flare sectarian tensions if it were to be mainstreamed? So studies on women such as Fatima face a double jeopardy, which would explain the scarcity of academic published works on the subject. For example, Christopher Clohisi's book titled Fatima, the Daughter of Muhammad, originally published in 2009, was probably the second significant biographical work on Fatima after Ali Shariati's Fatima is Fatima which was originally published in Farsi in 1971 and later translated into English. While contemporary feminist scholarship in Islamic studies is valuable and thriving, I argue that most of it is either reactionary to Islamophobic notions about visibly Muslim women or in alignment with the white secular feminist attitude of disauthenticating pious Muslim women's theological voices for justice and equity as not critical enough. So I ask again, is Fatima understudied in contemporary 
women's studies in Islam because she is a religious woman who argues for her rights from within her tradition? I raised this question while presenting at an event jointly organized by the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at UC Berkeley and the Bayan Institute earlier this month. Drawing on a case study of the eighth century female Shia activist, Um Khalid, whose hands were amputated by the government for supporting the Zaydi movement, I argued that in prescriptively following the orders and methods of Western secular knowledge production, contemporary Islamic feminist scholarship was gravely remiss in deploying constructive methods to center the narratives of early female scholar activists, such as Fatima and Um Khalid. During my research on the sermon, I came across other inspirational female figures who had supported the Fatimi movement, and again, underrepresented it in discourses around women in Islam. Women such as Um Ayman, an African woman who appeared as a witness for Fatima in her case, in her case against the Caliph, when most male residents of Medina declined to support her stand against the political authority. Fidda, another African woman, accompanied Fatima to the mosque for moral support, and then decades later, joined Fatima's son Hussein in his stand for freedom and justice against the caliph of his time, Yazid. Fidda was so proficient in the Quran that she spoke nothing but the Quran for 20 years of her life. In a recent paper that I presented to my colleagues at the Department of Sacred Texts and their interpretations here at the GTU, I shared my concern over the lack of extensive research on narratives of early African Muslim women, begging the question once again, is it because they are women or is it because they are women inclined to Shia thought? Is it because they are religious women or is it because they are women of color? My work is driven by these questions that interrogate the intellectual silence around the narratives of early female figures that are relevant, I believe, to the lived experiences of Muslim women and can make robust contributions to contemporary theoretical discourses on women and religious, racial, and political minorities. In my dissertation, I explored the Sermon of Fatima to reclaim the voice of a Muslim female theologian, a leader and an activist for social justice, whose narrative has been pushed to the margins of Islamic history and is missing in contemporary Islamic scholarship. I want to proceed to highlight the themes of women's theology, leadership and social justice from the Sermon of Fatima. Now there is no simple or easy definition for women's theology or feminist theology. It spans across traditions and times, including scholarship that addresses issues of systemic injustice and oppressive social orders around race, gender, and class from the perspective of religion and faith. Fatima's theological insight is demonstrated in the topics that she elaborated on and, and the method of her argumentation that she used in her sermon. She spoke on topics such as the concept of Tawheed, monotheism, the concept of divinely appointed guides and the emblematic position of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and on his family among them the embodiment of the messages of the Quran as a code for Muslim life, the philosophy behind obligatory acts of worship and other rituals. She spoke about her own central position in the fundamental aspects of Islam and Muslims, her disappointment at the Muslims' disregard for the Prophet's traditions, her Quranic argument for female inheritance rights, and her direct critique of Muslims' inaction and silence in the face of injustice. These were some of the themes she addressed in her sermon. But another remarkable feature is her deployment of a Quranic hermeneutics and methodology throughout her sermon. I argue that this sermon might be the earliest post-prophetic Quranic 
exegetical model, considering that it was delivered just 10 days after the prophet's demise. There she was, an 18-year-old woman who marched into the mosque of the prophet to address the caliph and the male-dominated audience gathered there. She said, where is it in the book of God that you may inherit from your father and I may not inherit from mine? Now she was directly engaging the caliph and holding him responsible for confiscating her lands. To this, the caliph replied that he had heard the prophet say that God's prophets neither receive nor leave inheritance. Their property therefore belongs to the Muslim nation. She responded, have you purposely abandoned the book of God and cast it behind your backs? When it clearly states, and now she starts enlisting five verses from the Quran. And this is what I mean about her theological method in arguing for her rights. So she is now going to enlist five verses, which I will mark out as I speak. She said, have you purposely abandoned the book of God and cast it behind your backs when it clearly states, and Suleiman inherited from Dawood, Solomon and David. This is Q 20, 27, 16. She continued, and when relating the story of Zachariah, God said, so grant me from yourself an heir who will inherit from me and inherit from the family of Yaqub. This is verse number five and six from chapter 19 of the Quran. She continued that the Quran further states, blood relatives are more entitled to inherit from one another according to the book of God. This is part of a verse, which is verse 75 from chapter eight. She went on to narrate another verse, Allah enjoins you concerning your children, the male and the female. This is verse 11 from chapter four of the Quran. She continued, if a believer leave, leaves behind any property, he should make a bequest for his parents and relatives in kindness. This is an obligation for the God wary. This is verse 180 from chapter two of the Quran. So she enlisted five verses critiquing a hadith that the caliph had just rendered. He said that he had heard the prophet say that we prophets do not inherit, nor do we leave any inheritance. Whatever we leave behind is the property of the Muslim nation. So she critiqued him by listing these five verses. And then she went on to say, yet you claim that I have no entitlement and inheritance from my father. So she presented these verses and then she said, you still deny me my inheritance? And then I, I, I just, I'm just amazed by her sheer audacity here. She continues and she says, has Allah revealed a special verse of the Quran upon you, which he excluded my father from? As in my father, the prophet did not get a certain verse that you have knowledge of. And then she continued, are my father and I not upon the faith of Islam? As in, are you trying to say that these rules of inheritance for Muslims don't apply to me and my father? She went on and she said, or is it that you have a greater knowledge of a particular and general injunction of the Quran more than my father had? So now she's you know, totally confronting the caliph and saying, do you understand something better about the Quran than the prophet himself? Now these above, this excerpt that I've just shared with you highlights her confidence in her own knowledge of the Quran. For someone to come up and say, where is it in the Quran that you get your father's inheritance and I don't, clearly demonstrates that this person is well-versed with the verses of the Quran, has not only memorized them, but has the aptitude of applying them to a certain condition to demand justice. So the first two verses, if you would have noted, are about prophets inheriting from one another. So David and Solomon, Zechariah and Yahya. So she's trying to say that my dad or my father, the prophet would not have said something that is not valid for other prophets in the Quran. And then the other three verses that she's talking about are directly engaging the Muslim audience, asking them, commanding them 
to make a will for their daughters and their sons. So she is demonstrating all of this, her theological knowledge and her, uh, and her proficiency over uh, the content of the Quran and the application of the Quran, right? And, and she's saying this uh, in such a way where she's exonerating her father from not practicing what he was preaching. So there comes a part in the, a part in the sermon where she says, praise be to God, my father, the messenger of God, never turned away from the book of God, nor did he oppose the injunctions of the book of God. Rather, he followed its directives and abided by its lofty teachings. Are you trying to add a treachery by ascribing falsehood to him? Now, what is she doing here in this excerpt from the sermon? What is she doing here? She is reading the Quran from the perspective of women's right to inherit. And at the same time, she is disputing the authenticity of a hadith rendered by the caliph. One might say that she's doing a sort of a feminist theology, but I argue that she is doing theology, period. She is taking a hadith that denies her inheritance right, juxtaposing it with the verses and the themes of the Quran, demonstrating that the hadith in question is in violation of the edicts of the Quran, and thus calling that it cannot be implemented in her case as law. This is precisely how Islamic theology and hadith studies developed 150 years later after the period of the sermon. So she is setting a precedent for Islamic theology as a field and as a discipline itself. She is demonstrating theology in its essence, and she just happens to be a woman. This method resonates with the works of contemporary Muslim feminist scholars as well, such as Rifat Hassan, Jerusha Tanner, who uh, inspires us with her rendition of the Muslima theology, the theology of Muslim women. Selene Ibrahim and Amina Inlos, to name a few, have written about uh, women and, and gender in the Quran from the perspective of arguing women's rights from within the tradition. But along with theological concepts and methods, uh, that the sermon demonstrate, I believe that it also demonstrates a unique understanding of leadership, which is different from other ideas of leadership. In her sermon, Fatima explains leadership through the metaphor of a camel. She says, now these are her words, you have branded a camel that does not belong to you and one that you are not equipped to ride. As a result, you will injure the nostrils of the beast and it will drive you to a mal destination. We, on the other hand, now she is alluding to the leadership of the Ahlul Bayt, her husband, uh, who is Imam Ali, and according to the Shia uh, thought, considered the rightful heir to the Prophet or the right successor to the Prophet. So she is, she is sort of advocating for her own and her family's leadership when she says, we, on the other hand, would have led the camel and the caravan at a pace that would not wear out the animals nor the people. And we would have guided the masses secretly and openly till they arrived at their best destinations. And then in sheer frustration, she says, so take its reins and saddle it with its sore back and its tired hooves, ever disgraceful, branded with the wrath of God and eternal dishonor. Now, now this is where she puts in her rage and her emotions into what she was trying to say. But I want to take you back to the metaphor of leadership that she presents here. In this metaphor, leadership is presented as a place of service and care. Leadership through service and care, not a leadership for control and power. This idea of leadership resonates closely with the experience of women as mothers, partners, and community leaders. Women serve the home, the community, and the nation, while a chosen few enjoy the reins of power and authority. Fatima highlighted that leadership ex is executed through care and empathy. 
And I raise this aspect because almost every course I teach on Islam, I am asked the question, can Muslim women be imams? Just like we have ordained women pastors and rabbis. I answer by pointing out that there is no definitive concept of clergy in Islam. You don't need an imam to pronounce a wedding or a divorce or for funeral rites or for burials or for leading a prayer for that matter. It, it doesn't have a special institution. If four or five people Muslims gather in a place and it is time to prayer, they might elect or ask one of them to lead the prayer and the rest of them would follow. So the concept of religious leadership is different in Islam than it is in, in other religious traditions. Sometimes I get questions like, can Muslim women's, uh, you know, can Muslim women lead men in prayer? And, and I sort of, you know, reverse that question around and I ask, can Muslim women's leadership be recognized only if they are named imams or they lead men in prayer? Wouldn't this be dismissing the pioneering role of Muslim women as mothers, single mothers, community volunteers, halaqa leaders, and all those who work to serve their societies. In the example of the sermon of Fatima, she was giving a sermon in the mosque. There she was, she was in the mosque. She was giving a sermon, but it wasn't a Friday sermon. It wasn't a religious sermon. It was a sermon questioning unjust actions of the political authority. And that made her a leader, even you know, even without those concepts of leadership that we have in, in our mind, she was leading and she was a leader. In fact, Christopher Clohisi in his book, uh, Half My Heart, which is a biographical work on Zainab, the daughter of Fatima, says that Zainab was actually taking the lead while Ali Sajjad, the fourth Imam, was, you know, held captive by the Yazidis. And in the same way, I argue that Fatima was taking the lead for the Muslim nation for the minority Muslim nation at that point, while Imam Ali was silent and he was in his home. So she is taking on a leadership role, a leadership role that is empowered by care and empathy and not by control or power. Earlier, I referred to Fatima, Fatima stance as a movement. And sometimes in my community lectures, I refer to it as the Fatimi movement. And I call it that because it was an organized effort to question the, unjust, uh, the, the unjust uh, declaration by the political authority of her time. But coming to the last aspect of, of uh, the theme, at least for, for today that I wanted to touch upon, I wanted to talk about women's theology. I wanted to talk about a concept of leadership. And I also wanted to talk about social justice from the perspective of this sermon. And before I proceed to highlight just a few more points from there, I think it's important to uh, lay out a little more context for what Fadak was. In the beginning, I said that it was a fertile land and agricultural land that was, that was situated on the outskirts of Medina. Now, this was a huge land. And, from, and on this land, Fatima had employed workers who would go there and they would work on that land. And the revenue from that land was a sizable amount. And she would then make sure that the money from that is given as charity to almost all the homes in Medina. So the property was not just, was her property, but she was not the only one that was benefiting from it. There was a staff, there, were, there was labor that was benefiting from it. And then there were households, orphans, needy, you know, single parents who needed the money and who were benefiting from that revenue. And when the government confiscated that land, all those people lost their jobs and their source of revenue. So when she walked into the mosque and demanded for Fadak to be returned to her, she was actually bringing attention to that class of Muslims in Medina who depended on the revenue of Fadak for meeting their day-to-day -day needs. So she also brought attention to the minorities in the class system or, or, or the classes, economical classes that we see in a society. It was a sermon that was calling for justice, for humanity in the name of God. And she was holding her entire audience accountable to serve 
to make sure that social justice was met. I want to share an excerpt from her sermon that, that sort of it clarifies that a little further. She said, addressing the crowd, oh, people of understanding, oh, supporters of faith and defenders of Islam, what is the cause of your negligence in defending my rights? and the laxity before the injustice being done to me here. Will I be deprived of my inheritance while you watch and listen? And while you are all gathered here as witnesses to what is happening, you are involved in the claim that I'm making and you are aware of my right to it. You are a majority, you are well-equipped and you possess the means and strength to aid me, and yet you are silent. The case has reached you, she said, yet you don't respond. You hear the cry of injustice, yet you do not assist the oppressed. Now, these are powerful statements that she's making in, in that sermon in front of her crowd. And, and once again, if you can bring that picture to your mind, she's an 18 year old or a 23-year-old, depending because there is a difference. Uh, she's either born five years before or after the prophetic mission. So the five-year gap is there. She's either an 18-year-old or a 20-something-year-old who stands in front of a predominantly male audience and questions the caliph. Where is it in the book of God that you can take away my inheritance, that you can claim leadership, and that you can deny the masses their right? I've been asked this question you know, after these presentations, I've been asked this question sometimes. Did she win the case? Did she get what she wanted? Did she get her land back? And, and the short answer is no, she didn't. But I think she was well aware that the odds of her getting her right were slim to none. But she took that stand for what she believed was right in the eyes of God. And in doing so, she encouraged every minority voice to stand up for justice. By protesting the confiscation of her lands in Fadak, she demolished the false stereotypes that a visibly pious Muslim woman should not engage in socio-political activism and absolutely not publicly address a male-dominated audience, and that too in the Mosque of the Prophet. She shattered that stereotype. She reminded Muslims that each and every one of them had a duty to uphold the truth and that the face of activism must be seen and the voice of justice must be heard, even if it upsets the status quo. In my dissertation, I studied the sermon as the voice of a female activist who was empowered by her tradition to call for social justice for women and the larger community. Here at the GTU, I am grateful to have learned from and learned with the finest. And now I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to work alongside the finest. In a fine institution that offers a rare opportunity to engage in critical scholarship from the perspective of religious, interreligious, and ethical notions of justice, peace, diversity, and inclusion. I am excited to add further diversity to the already rich Islamic studies scholarship that is being curated and produced here through the work of the Center for Islamic Studies. I'm also excited to you know, be in this position, which is a leading position for the Madrasa Midrasha program, but I, I, I realize that uh, there is just a colossal work of leadership done by uh, Dr. Aronoff and Dr. Jiwa. And I, I can't even imagine leading this program without their continued support. I, I feel that my, my study and my work and my scholarship places me at, at a good location to be able to take this lens, which, is, which I've used in my dissertation, and take it across all the traditions that are represented here at the GTU. I think it can engage critical theory. It can engage uh, many aspects of race uh, many aspects of social justice that we are delving into here at the GTU. And, and that is where I find uh, the encouragement to take on this leading position uh, in, in, with regard to the Madrasa Midrasha program here. 
uh, I'm, I'm thinking th th these are things that I'm envisioning, and I hope that you know I will have the support of, of the entire GTU staff, and especially Dr. Aronoff and Dr. Jiwa, in, in sort of curating this and shaping this uh, to make it beneficial not just to the scholarly community, uh, but also to people from confessional communities or from communities who do not want to confess to a certain or a particular religious faith. So I'm thinking about religious education, you know, programs around Jewish and Muslim religious education. And I think my years of writing curricula for uh, curricula for um, you know, institutions like the World Federation of Kodeshi Islamic uh, Centers in Stanmore and, and other places in the world where I've written uh, these syllabi, I would be able to sort of contribute towards um, hosting programs on Jewish and Muslim religious education perhaps around uh, Jewish and Muslim rites and rituals. I also have an experience of, of decades as a pilgrim guide where I've, where I've led people into pilgrimages into for Hajj and you know, in Iraq and Iran and other important Islamic sites in the world. And I think that also makes for a great exploration for collaborative work. So I'm hoping we can do something on those lines. I also want to bring in the arts and aesthetics. We have our own uh, you know, Carol Beer, who's been here at, at the CIS and amazes us each time when she presents. And, and I think in her recent trip to Uz Uzbekistan, she also shared Muslim and Jewish um, artwork around rites and rituals. We can absolutely talk about women and gender. And I'm so thrilled that I got this opportunity to teach the Madrasa uh, Midrasha course on women and gender and Jewish and Islamic studies alongside Dr. Naomi Seidman, which was a delight for my own scholarship. And I, and I look up to and I admire the work that she has done. Uh, we could absolutely talk about sacred seasons, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, that most of these seasons align in the year and, and gives us an opportunity to talk about how we experience that in, in different diasporas. Of course, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, these are major things affecting our communities. We could also think about hopefully after the pandemic is over and we're able to move around, maybe museum visits. I'm especially interested in doing something around Jewish and Muslim uh, mystical thought and spirituality. In fact, for the next spring, I propose that we do that, that course on mystical and spiritual thought in Jewish and Islamic uh, traditions. We have our Sam uh, Dr. Sam Shankov, who could, who I'm thinking of, you know, of, of drawing in his expertise to formulate that course. We could also talk about uh, law, leadership, spiritual care, chaplaincy, and we have an entire program dedicated to that at the GTU, and enough resources to put a uh, put an educational series together for our community. And of course, we can continue the the work uh, that is already being done in terms of faculty colloquia you know, conversations, faculty research conversations, student research grants, and other opportunities for learning in the summer, as well as the intercession period. Uh, I hope that uh, this, this work that I do can bring, uh, can serve as a lens to open up conversations on theology, on reading of sacred texts, and on application of religious rites and rituals to matters of race, gender, um, and, and re religious and religious and political minorities. Uh, thank you so much for giving me your attention. I welcome your feedback. I welcome your questions and your comments. And I am positively sure that they're going to enrich my scholarship and my work. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you so much, Majabeen. So I think you can all see um, why we're so delighted to have Dr. Dalla on board. You know, I don't really need to say more than that. That uh, it's just been so wonderful. Um, Dr. Dalla, thank you for um, educating me about Fatima and making her seem like a real, not just a real person, but a relevant person for our time. Um, very inspiring in, in many, many different ways. And I look forward to your leadership um, of Madrasa Madrasha like a, like a camel. I think that you'll uh, be able to, to give it that gentle guidance. So I very much look forward to that. Um, if people have questions, please put them in the, the chat directed to me and I'll um, look through those. So, but meanwhile, I'll just say thanks again uh, to Dr. Dalla and, and a big warm welcome from everyone at the GTU to you. And I wanna say thanks again to those who have supported um, Majabin in this position. Thanks to the Hellman Foundation, 
Thanks to the Walter and Elise Haas Fund for support of Dr. Dalla and also for the Center for Islamic Studies, the Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies, and the Madrasa Midrasha program, which is going to be um, just taking off uh, under the wings of Dr. Dalla. And you've seen, she's shared with us some of her many ideas. So what we look forward to um, seeing how those develop. Um, okay, so I have a question for you, Dr. Dalla. Can you say something about how um, the sermon was preserved? You know, considering its content, it seems likely that we're lucky that it was preserved. Yeah, thank you for that question. And in fact, it makes uh, for a huge chapter in, in my dissertation. Um, so it, it was preserved orally for about 200 years. Um, and uh, when I was reading the 14th century Islamic scholar uh, by the name of uh, Ibn Abil Hadid al-Mu'tazali, uh, he, he put a remark in his notes where he said that whenever I traveled to Baghdad, uh, if I wanted to know who was from the lineage of Fatima, it would be easy because they would have had the sermon memorized. So when um, immediately after Fatima's sermon, her children memorized it and then their children memorized it. And it sort of went on as, a, as an oral tradition, as a memory um, and, and a document in, in, in the minds uh, of her family. And then later on it extended to the Shias uh, or the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt. Uh, I think its first written appearance, uh, again, this is debatable because there are uh, scholars who have said that uh, her works are, or her sermon appears in the book of Sulaim, um, Kitabu Sulaim, as it is called. And uh, that book was written in the seventh century. So it was only about 40 or 50 years after uh, the, the demise of the prophet, uh, which, which it was found at that time. But its proper documentation is available in uh, uh, in the book by the name of Balagatun Nisa, written by Ibn Tayfur. And Ibn Tayfur, he's a 10th century scholar. And, and when he collected this, or he compiled a book called The Eloquence of Women, and the Sermon of Fatima is chapter two in that book. And uh, when he cites his sources, he said that he got it from two chain of narrations, one from the children of Zayd ibn Ali. So this Ali is the fourth Zayd, the son of Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali, who is the husband of Fatima. So he got it from that generation. And he, he also posts another link of narrators where the link goes back to Zainab, the daughter of Fatima. So this shows that the children were memorizing it and sort of holding it to, to their memory as, as, as a treasure or, or, or part of their history that was not, of course, going to be recorded by authorities that were recording uh, what was happening, you know, by the mainstream. So they felt left out and that is how it was preserved and, and that's how we have it. Thank you. Um, that kind of leads into the next question, which is uh, what are the short-term and long-term effects of the sermon? Uh, was Fatima seen as a role model then and how about today? Yeah, thank you for that question. And, and I think that's very relevant to my scholarship. Um, the immediate reaction was that she was ostracized. She spent her days only at the grave of her father and she died 60 days, within 60 days of the episode. And she died in such a way that we don't even know where her grave is. So there, there's, she, she wanted a quiet burial. She didn't want any of the political authorities involved in her burial rites. And, and, and this is what her wish was. So the immediate effect was that uh, people were discouraged. Uh, people who followed her became a minority and, and just disappeared and decided to hold on to these values to themselves. But in that silence, what took shape was the Shia identity. So uh, you found that she became a linchpin for Shia theology and identity. So now works of Fatima, children of Fatima, the household of Fatima became the place where people would gather to discuss issues of minorities. And that is why her son Hussein, then 50 years later, rises against the Caliph Yazid, 
demanding freedom and justice. And I think that is an episode which is very famous uh, of how he was massacred and his women folk were taken as captive to Damascus. And then her daughter's sermon revisited all those values that were being harbored uh, or, or that were you know, drawing upon the sermon of Fatima herself. So the sermon of Zainab is another very interesting piece and I hope someday I can, I can get to that. Uh, Christopher Clohisi has written a book on it and he calls it the Zainabian theology. You know, because the daughter, again, was using the Quran, was using theology to argue for uh, the rights of the captives and, and the legitimacy of the revolution in front of the, the caliph. So, so that's another story. But this is what is happening immediately. And, and in the long term, you find that uh, Fatima is, has, a, has her impact on the Fatimid dynasty, for example. Fatima has an impact on uh, spiritual life. So you have the tasbih of Fatima, you know, the uh, the chanting of the names of God as, as prescribed by Fatima, which is again a very important part of, the, uh, of Muslims practice. You have a young Fatimiyya, which are known as the days of Fatima. And, and I believe uh, Shia communities throughout the world will commemorate these days of Fatimiyya with, when they will revisit these topics, revisit the sermon and, and recite it and engage in conversations about uh, contemporary issues like domestic violence or uh, you know, empowerment of women on the basis of this sermon. So it continues to be studied. It continues to be at least held in, uh, in sacred regard in these communities and in these populations. In the confessional circles, there have been, uh, there have been many uh, works on an exegesis of the Sermon of Fatima, but my argument has always been that they have portrayed her as, as a domicile, humble woman, and, and, that, and there's nothing wrong with it, and a pious woman, but what I like to highlight is her activist attitude and her courage in speaking truth to power, and in doing so, she actually shatters many of the cultural um, norms that are prevalent in Muslim societies today. So, so it has made its immediate and its, and its long-term impact. Thank you for that question. Okay, maybe um, one more question. Uh, let's see. Oh, someone just wrote a question that they then took back. Okay, here's another one. Um, Dr. Della, can you say a bit about why even Tufali decided to commit it to writing? What does that say about his social, cultural, the theological context? Okay, I'm going to just ask you to repeat the starting part. I couldn't hear you there. You froze for a bit. Uh, can you say a bit about why Ibn Tufal decided to commit it to writing? Sorry, it's jumping around. Yeah, got that. Yeah. Um, what does that say about his social, cultural, theological context? Okay, yeah, thank you for that question. And, and he was a, a scholar who uh, was a contemporary of the Abbasid era. So the Abbasid rule, that is what you're looking at. And during the Abbasid dynasty, you found a shift in the cultural values of the Muslims. So you had places like Dar al Hikmah that were uh, making copies of books and copies of Quran and copies of a Hadith and making sure that it was available largely to the Muslim audience. It was also the era where people were translating works of Greek into Arabic so that Greek thoughts and Greek ideologies could be uh, you know, brought into conversation with Islamic ideology and thoughts. And you had that. So it was an era of an era where knowledge flourished culture flourished and Ibn Tayfur was uh, found himself and, and that was his field. He was a linguist. He was a poet and a linguist and he was interested in studying uh, eloquent works and eloquent speeches and, and poetry and uh, somehow he was in, attracted to uh, sort of explore the speeches and, and eloquent renditions of women and, and that's where he put this together. So I, I think it was the favorable climate of his time. You're looking at the 10th century, the Abbasid era, and, and its funding of this kind of work, you know, work around culture, work around art, language. And, and I think those were the favorable circumstances that sort of uh, made it easy for him to put it together in a written form. Uh, wonderful. Um, so I think we'll 
end our evening here. Um, and just with, um, again, with a lot of gratitude to you, Dr. Dalla, and welcome to the GTU. We're thrilled to have you continue here in another new role as Assistant Professor of Islamic Studies and Director of the Madrasa Midrasha Program. Um, thanks to Dr. Aronoff and Dr. Jiwa. And thanks to all of you uh, for coming. Um, it was really wonderful to see such a great turnout and such great support. And we hope to see you at events in the future. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Thank you one and Thank all. Thank you, Masha Bean.